Welcome to the first event of our Friday Lecture Series, which is an important um, activity of community life here uh, for a number of reasons. Um, for one thing, we sometimes might feel as though we're working in isolation, uh, as though we're separate from the larger academic world, when actually remi we're reminded when we have some messengers come in from the outside that this is a much larger project than even this campus is um, recognizing and celebrating. And so that is extremely important that we feel connected intellectually and spiritually with the larger community. Um, a lecture, of course, is a little bit different from a seminar discussion. Uh, what it allows for a person to do is to um, take an idea and expand on it for a longer period of time for all of us to contemplate. So the lecturer is not telling us what to think but saying, look, this is a path that I've been on. I've been down it several times. Um, and so I'd like you to look with me and see if you see what I see. So our lecture series um, allows for discussion afterwards. You'd be welcome to ask, ask questions uh, or bring up, make comments um, or object to things if you, if you so desire. So our speaker launching this semester is Dr. Kathleen Marks, um, who is Associate Professor of English, um, Interim Chair, and Director of, of, of Liberal Studies at St. John's University. Um, and so she received uh, her PhD from the University of Dallas. Her book, Tony, on Toni Morrison's Beloved, is a study of uh, Greek religion as is represented in that novel, that extremely important novel, uh, Beloved. So she, uh, she captures the, um, see, the, the connection and the intersection between Greek religion, mythology, such as you have studied here, and that, that modern novel. So she's written a number of uh, classical, um, she's written articles on a number of classical and modern works um, of literature. She is um, <coughs> including Homer's Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, and, um, and uh, various other writers as well. In um, addition, uh, she, to support, she, uh, let's see, at St. John's, she's, uh, she's very busy with administration there, and so um, has been now her husband, um, I might have mentioned him before, teaches at Hostess Community College, where he and a colleague uh, is arguably the first congressional district in the country, uh, largely um, people with um, other than English as, a, as their uh, native language. In fact, I think he said in one class they had 40 uh, different native languages represented in one class. So uh, this is a writing uh, sequence, and um, but they, what they've done is buck the tide and reintroduce classics, introduce classics into these courses. And she tells me now that there are four community colleges doing this now. They, he and his colleague have in fact uh, gotten tremendous grants. They have a partnership with Columbia University. So this is an amazing uh, project. And the two of them together, I think of them as leading a dedicated life in the intellectual world uh, together. And this is something extremely satisfying to the teacher because they were both our students um, in previous life there, Dr. Sampos as well. And uh, you all know their niece, Nora, uh, who's a freshman here this year. Um, four other nieces, uh, no, three other nieces attended our summer program for high school students. So we have connections there. And um, Dr. Marx, you know, was a, a pioneering student, I would have to say, at our liberal arts institution. Um, and in fact, she can talk to you a bit about the cyclical humanities cycle, if you like, because she experienced that throughout her four years. In fact, that kind of order, a variation on that. So I'm sure she'd be willing to discuss that. Uh, this is an innovation for us here. Um, and I think you find her a kindred spirit um, in her talk. And so we're um, very delighted to have her launch the semester. Um, and I know Dr. Sampo must be hovering listening in. I still remember one time we were chatting about various and reminiscing about various alumni that we had because as he used to say um, we talk about the, the other graduates, previous graduates we speak of in the days when there were giants 
you know, all of these. That's how you'll be remembered, I hope, too. That's we hope. And uh, one time, I remember, we were just talking about alumni that we had, were proud of, and, and he said, I like Kathleen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so there's a kind of friendship that develops, as I think you've already experienced here, that goes on, in fact, uh, out into the world, in fact, and it's a source of love and renewal in the world itself. So I think Dr. Marks, we welcome you to speak about Hamlet. Thank you, Mary. Um, it's nice to see real people. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I would like to, um, for the good or the ill, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Dr. Peter Sampo, founder of my alma mater and yours. Um, uh, the title, Hamlet's Virgilian Lot in the Suffering Hero, Perhaps if I had put Virgilian lot in quotation marks, it would make a little bit more sense. Um, the, the, the theme, the, the topic I'm talking about tonight is the prophetic, um, and a Virgilian lot is actually um, a type of uh, kind of a drawing lots, right, and drawing your, fa drawing your fate. So that's sort of ultimately what I'm going to get to at the end, but the idea, the general idea is the prophetic. And it's uh, an idea that I'm going to ask you to... Um, suspend your willing disbelief on. Um, and just, just, just go with me and see where we get. Um, so somehow, even in the midst of upheaval, educational and otherwise, when so much has been and continues to be lost to the world, most of us still have some recollection of Hamlet. Literary critics love or hate him, and often find it hard to abide readings that contradict their own. But what more could be said by anyone about a play published in 1604 that has been analyzed without end. And yet, you might be surprised to know that 600 books have been written on Hamlet in the 21st century alone. Certainly indicative of the inexhaustibility of great art, but also perhaps of the needs both to cling to something we share in common and for seeing the play anew in this our time. The play's full title, The Tragical History of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, is less about the character of its main hero than it is about the tragic situation, as C.S. Lewis saw, in which he suddenly finds himself and rightly assesses as not essentially a problem of revenge, but one of time. A time that has somehow gone awry, is out of joint. Indeed, while tragedy is about the tendency to uphold man and fall and a falling away from the belief in the gods, it's about the limits of man coming up against the gods, often evidenced by no time to spare in the action. Hamlet is thematically about things being divided, appearance from reality, words from thoughts, and with respect to time, the chronological from the sacred. The play, then, is an investigation into the dislocation of Hamlet's present as it becomes the Renaissance from its royal medieval past, threatening his future and the integrity of time itself. My focus is on one dedicated prince, having what he describes as a prophetic soul, seeing, saying, and especially suffering unto death to set time right however cursed he may feel to have been born to his lot. So I want to connect the play's dual-related concerns of time and prophecy as they are suffered by Hamlet. In a book-length study of Hamlet that I would like, hope to call prophetic play, and that perhaps um, you all help me with tonight, I see Shakespeare and then his works, some like Macbeth with its weird witches, more obviously so, but somehow Hamlet, um, most of all, as prophetic. Here is the relevant quotation as Hamlet talks to the ghost of his father. The ghost says, But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. And Hamlet responds, O oh, my prophetic soul, which he follows directly with my uncle. So what the ghost says is arguably prophetic itself. King Hamlet is killed in the blossoms of his sin, 
but is not damned and therefore to be trusted, it seems to me, as both one who validates an afterlife, just by being there, and one who is implicitly trustworthy, but not as an angel, not as perfect. Howsoever Hamlet pursues his tasks, the ghost says in oracular fashion to his son, taint not thy mind. Hamlet must suffer and die, but without damning his soul. One critic observes that Hamlet fathoms the nature of the tragic abyss, not in retrospect like Shakespeare, but in prospect. So, Hamlet is caught in a situation in which it is impossible for him not to sin and therefore suffer going forward. As he steps into the fray, so to speak. But here, in the communion of the immortal souls, the ghost dispels any skepticism about the soul within or the life hereafter. And Hamlet's direct response to the revelation of murder from the ghost, O oh, my prophetic soul, is as validation of Claudius as the proximate cause of the rottenness of Denmark. And indeed, Claudius does not repent, but doubles down on his acts of disconnecting heads of states from their bodies or speech from thinking. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So the prophetic is already set up as hindsight prophecy, as affirming something already known. And I mean by prophetic in this play, a backward before a forward glance. I mean something along the lines of what my friend Paul Connell writes of Dostoevsky's The Possessed. As a novel about what has occurred, what is occurring, and what may still be averted, the action pierces in a prophetic way the nature of time. To be prophetic in this sense, he continues, is not to predict the future, but to present an action in its full implications. We often take prophecy as only fortune-telling or predicting the future. Shakespeare, writing just before the oncoming of the Enlightenment, well, not just before, but before the oncoming of the Enlightenment and the height um, of a time, so the height of the Renaissance and the height of any time is when tragedies are written so that they can predict and warn against a fall, was concerned then with past and future, false and too true prophetics of his time. The century turn, so again, Hamlet 1600-ish, right? Um, the century turn brought about brought out the prognosticators, right? Who made very certain and assured predictions about how things would go, um, especially as the long reigning Elizabeth was nearing her end. Um, she died in 1603, it turned out. In his Sonnet 107, Shakespeare's Sonnet 107, written around the same time as Hamlet, he uses the same phrase, prophetic soul. Um, though here it is of the wide world, alluding to the kind of group speculation that can take on false meaning in changing times. Incertainties now crown themselves assured, and peace proclaims olives of endless age. In Hamlet, I argue that Shakespeare explores a true prophetic soul. To see what really can be seen and said when one is faithful to calling. So he tells a Danish tale set apart from England and about 100 years earlier during a different shift, during the shift from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Um, a transition survived already and reviewable, affording Shakespeare, um, who then imbues his hero with a kind of um, it, it affords Shakespeare himself with a kind of prescience, but he then uh, transfers that in, um, into, into Hamlet. Hamlet seems to have a, a kind of prescience that, that Shakespeare has, that Shakespeare has earned, but how does, she, how does Hamlet know so much, right? Um, uh, who then imbues his hero with a kind of prescient, panoramic, even global, if you will, vision. Hamlet presents the broad implications of his worldview change from God-centered to man-centered. It traces not so much the acts of the prince. Thus, critics focusing on his delays in killing King Claudius mistake the point. 
as it does the spirit of the action arising from the words of his prophetic soul in their capacity to recapitulate a godly past that must not be forgotten if the present is to be seen in the right context and if any future kingdom on earth is to be as it is in heaven. This kind of prophetic history was initiated more originally by Virgil. And of course my talk will eventually, near the end, focus on Hamlet's Virgilian lot, a suffering hero. But Virgilian lots is the translation for the, um, I'm going to say it this way, but I should have asked beforehand somebody, um, uh, for the Sortes Virgiliani, right? These, the Virgilian lots, or the ancient method of finding your fate as prophesied by opening the Aeneid and as a kind of bibliomancy, bibliomancy just landing on, blindly on a passage, much like um, St. Augustine does later with the Bible in his famous Confessions conversion uh, scene. Historical figures lived and died by this method, and I think I see an example of it in the comparison between Act Two of Hamlet and Book Two of Aeneid that I will eventually share. But like Virgil, says scholar William Frank, Dante interprets history prophetically, finding in it the essential pattern of things to come. So the whole reach of Dante's Commedia, a study of yours, I believe, um, for the upcoming 700th anniversary, is one into an eschatological future beyond history altogether, to an uncannily dynamic realization of eternity. Like Virgil too, Shakespeare's backward glance gives insight into Hamlet's day, but also to his own giving us something of an everyman in Hamlet, an eternal pattern of the archetypal suffering hero that is more like Aeneas in his rescuing of the household gods for a new world than like the traditional tragic figure of Oedipus, for instance, having to come to grips with his own blindness. Yet Hamlet is not an epic like Aeneid, but a tragedy in which, since the Greeks Prophecy has played an important, but still not thoroughly understood role of advancing the cause and speaking for the gods, as is the etymological definition. It is a heightened kind of speech, often cryptic and needing interpretation. Tiresias, the seer in the Oedipus cycle, speaks prophetically of what has already taken place. And of course, the oracle, you will kill your father and marry your mother, is a riddle misinterpreted and thus fulfilled as literal as a fait accompli by Oedipus to bad end. So the prophetic is double-edged without cooperation rather than disconnection between man and gods. But in tragedy, know thyself, the great maxim over Apollo's oracle of Delphi is paramount. Not only is it in keeping with the Socratic idea of the unexamined life not being worth living, um, it gets at the operations of tragedy on a generic level. Tragedies are epistemological, and this one is very consciously about what we can know. They are about what we can know about ourselves in relation to the gods and the universe. But despite Hamlet's philosophical bent and the subject of his study in Wittenberg, the ghost scene coalesces in a prophetic soul insight. Here, that his whole education has been a preparing not to be king, but for this final moment of princely duty, and that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in philosophy. Indeed, the knowledge derived from the prophetic is grammatic, linguistic, and above all, poetic. And while William Frank is so excellent on the prophetic in Dante, he falls apart when the world does. In the less holistic time of Hamlet, Frank sees only an eclipse of the prophetic, failing to see, I think, that the skeptical philosophy present in the play is rather eclipsed by the prophetic power of poetry to give us not a revenge play, but a modern ancient tragedy. Thus, the play presents both a problematic skepticism and, through the protagonist's thoughtful engagement with it and the cosmos, the possibility of pattern recognition that can be found in the literary genres as brought to us by Aristotle. To the extent that Hamlet is a Christian tragedy, the hero is one caught more precisely in the middle 
of his situation. I think this is, this is Louise Cowan's insight, um, and I think it's really, really crucial to seeing Hamlet differently. In the context of this play, he lives on the dividing line between um, being a medieval prince with the sort of sparing luxury we see in my preferred Mel Gibson Hamlet, and a Renaissance prince with the marble floors as can be seen in the Kenneth Branagh Hamlet. The liminality or threshold state of the play between two orders that is seen from the start with the changing of the guards and that's seen in the very beginning is due crucially to its position within the tragic genre as described by Louise Cowan. Her three divisions of tragedy correspond to tripartite tragedies of old, such as the Oresteia trilogy. The first play is about the fall. The second is the suffering stage, the suffering of a hero that may be different from the one who fell, as is the case with Hamlet. And the third stage reaches some type of reconciliation. Shakespeare gathers all three stages into one play, Cowan contends, occupying one stage primarily and implying the others. Hamlet and Macbeth, Louise concludes, like Prometheus bound and Job before them, all are in tragedy's middle stage of suffering, what Aristotle might call the passive pathos or passion, what Walter Brueggemann calls the critical element of the prophetic imagination, as suffering unto death points to the wrong ways in which others are living. In fact, the prophetic is a criticism. In Hamlet, including, in Hamlet, including a kind of self-criticism that I think makes him so vulnerable to all the judgment against him. I know for myself that the play opened itself to me in magical ways along the lines of what my friend Father Andrew calls the alchemy of praise when I looked in compassion and could see, could see that it's about what we all do and fail to do and can still do. In this stage of suffering, the fall can be distant in memory or as in Hamlet may have occurred recently, but it's marked by indecision, stasis, and crucifixion, explaining um, to my mind much of Hamlet's delays. The stasis is due in part to tragedy's prophetic turn to the past, bringing old myths to life through present tense dialogue that yet cannot change the action. The audience then becomes implicated in the inevitability of the hero's downfall, hoping with him not for some pre-fall standing, not for Denmark to impossibly be put back together as it once was, but for some catharsis, some cleansing communal knowledge that might arise from the destruction. In Hamlet, the knowledge is about suffering collapse in a fruitful way through a prophetic recovering of values from the wreckage, the household gods, to use Virgil's term, or perhaps the old verities, to use Faulkner's. In this way does tragedy enact a rite of passage from myth to drama that catches up archetypes in Hamlet, the archetype not merely of the suffering hero, but the hero as God, as God with a small g to start with at least. Um, as we shall see, hidden in the old stories, needed in the present for the sake of a future. And then about this play, I want to say and add that the prince's prophetic soul helps him lay the groundwork of a Denmark to go on without him, but perhaps with the most essential and distilled, almost oracular truths that he is able to rescue and then predict or presay as a new myth, or in our parlance, a new narrative. So the tragedy takes myth to, to, to drama and then cleanses and purifies in some way, but I wanna say that Hamlet goes one step further and tries to sort of articulate or lay the groundwork as, as Denmark is destroyed as it once was, he lays the groundwork for the future that is not going to be led by him. Um, the old myth, or backstory as the material for Hamlet's enactment, is Amleth. 
an Icelandic tale told most famously by the 13th century uh, Saxo Grammaticus and later by the French Belforest, who adds to Amlis' magical powers the ability to conjure up devils eventually turned into the Ur Hamlet and then Hamlet. Maybe both of those latter, um, maybe the Ur Hamlet even as well as Hamlet was written by Shakespeare. While changes are made from one version to another, there remains a strong vein of Amleth's perceptive and prophetic abilities, leading to the observation that in Amleth there is the concentration of, quote, several extraordinary perception motifs in one character, the lack of natural evidence, the interest in the past. But their cumulative effect in the Amleth saga suggests a protagonist who has a supernatural and indeed a prophetic gift of evoking things in a forgotten past. There has not been much written to suggest, as I do, that the play operates throughout through this idea of the prophetic soul um, in Hamlet. But there are two other forms of the word in the play, and both are first person prophesy. And surely, the overall effect helps to explain some of the ways Hamlet seems in the play always to be watching, overhearing, and seeing everything. Hamlet sees, as he says, the cherub that sees people's purposes and intents. And he comes too quickly from some critical perspectives to a paradoxical acceptance of a divinity that shapes our ends. But some critics think even the final acceptance of providence is too pat, too quick. Hamlet says, we defy augury. Unlike the seers who read, augury is the reading of the patterns of birds, right? Unlike the seers who read the patterns of birds to find their fate, for Christians, there is a special providence even in the fall of a sparrow. And if God's plan cares for the lives and deaths of birds, imagine what he has in mind for men. But the second part of Hamlet's insight into a divinity that shapes our ends is rough hew them how we will. He sees that God is the artist and we are but apprentices, apprentices, but that our role is not non-existent. We are cooperative. And so what is it that we can do? Hamlet settles upon the readiness is all. Literally, he means that since we cannot know when we will die, we ought always to be ready. No easy feat. But in the context of this play, ready to die means also to be clean enough of soul not to be damned. To make it at least to the purgatory where old King Hamlet seems to come from, perhaps as part of his temporal punishment, to announce to Hamlet that he was murdered and to give tasks that I see less as proscriptions than as ways to focus his son's mind that might otherwise be pulled in too many directions, much like our assignments and deadlines do for us when we study and write. Hamlet ends his pivotal providence speech with let be, which some critics have rightly seen is an answer to the famous soliloquized to be or not to be. Let be is a kind of fiat, a reference to Marian confidence, uh, an allowance of the subordinate and significant role man plays to be vigilant to his callings and ready to cooperate. The question of to be or not to be sets the stage for any discussion of suffering. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. The question is one of whether one can see with the mind's eye that it is more noble to accept the suffering that seeks us out or proactively to try and fight it. For Hamlet, the not knowing what is to come, the dread of something after death, makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we, not know, we know not of. So does Hamlet bear the whips and scorns of time, and so too does he burdens or fardels bear. Suffering is the bearing, the enduring, the allowing, and not suppressing either by choice or subjection a great pain that can bear or carry one under. It is present even in the bearing that delivers life in birth. Hamlet was born under pressure, we know now. 
the pressure to set time right. He is melancholy, as he tells us, weighed down by the great humor of black anger and its attendant anxieties. While we know that Hamlet has lately lost his mirth, being pressed by ills is not new to him. Twice in all of Shakespeare, and only by Hamlet, is the word pressure used. To direct his mind toward his tasks and keep his distracted globe of a head from forgetting, he calls upon his heart to hold and his sinews to bear him up stiffly, and he tells us how he will remember the ghost. I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past. Later, in his directions to the theater masters for the play within the play, he says that the end of playing is to hold the mirror up to nature and to show the very age and body of time, his form, and pressure. Hamlet seems to connect pressure to forms, all forms, all pressures, and to show the form and pressure of the body of time that is out of joint is both the curse of his birth and the gift of his being. Best expressed, it seems to me, in tragedy. Or it seems, I think it seems to him. Hamlet's temporary erasure of forms and pressures show his nuanced relation to the past. In fact, Hamlet's antic disposition, his speeches, his play, within the play, are all temporal strategies of uncovering truths that try to bring to the light of day for Denmark and audience alike the sources of the problems such that tragic catharsis can take place, even if a Gertrude or a Laertes might accept those truths and a Claudius might outright reject them. Not only, then, does Hamlet see immediately that the problem is less Claudius than it is one um, of time being out of joint, he also very early invokes the name of St. Patrick, who legend has it was shown by Christ the entrance to purgatory, man's typical route to heaven. Yet I think Patrick may also be seen as a kind of patron for Hamlet, to help him rid Denmark of its snakes. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are referred to as adders. <laughs> um, and including the serpent that did venomously kill his father. Even more, if my reading the prophetic as a pillar of the play is correct, St. Patrick, as the great baptizer, serves to recall to Hamlet's mind that by his own baptism as a medieval prince, is he anointed to the offices of Christ as prophet, but also of priest and king, whereby we all bear witness to truth through our speaking, ministering, and leading. So obviously on a literal level, O oh My Prophetic Soul reads as Hamlet saying he suspected, knew in his gut, that his uncle was a bad guy. But the validation of his soul's intuitions, or perhaps desires, regarding his uncle are nothing to Hamlet's soul selecting its own society among souls. The O of the utterance alone could be a subject of a talk. Long considered an apostrophe in poetry, the rhetorical device of the O is a form of address, in this case, uh, to Hamlet's own soul as mirror to the ghost. That is, if Hamlet can talk to the soul of his father, he can surely address his own soul, and therefore be in closer touch to the operations of soul, forming a stronger relationship between his own body and soul, and by extension, between man and God, or chronological and sacred, or words and thoughts, or being and seeming. I think this dialogic relationship is important to understanding how Hamlet is alone but not and to how he holds himself together in the face of collapse, especially through the soliloquy form that first appears in St. Augustine's Soliloquies, a book of inner dialogues and meditations wherein questions posed and answered lead to self-knowledge, which is an end of tragedy. Through Hamlet's prophetic voice, the soliloquies are as antidote by breathing truth into the poisonous conspiratorial atmosphere and as Jonathan Culler sees its possibilities, the O is a poetic word. And Frank might add, a poetic word is a prophetic word. 
having the power not only to animate the addressee, but the one who addresses, so that it is essentially uh, an, a relational ins a moment of inspiring creative energy. I want to say that Hamlet, while retaining his philosophical bent of mind throughout the play, becomes here in the beginning and through his cry from his soul for his soul, a kind of poet and prophet that both sees how things are and could be if he is willing to suffer. As an utterance that comes from within his prophetic soul about the state of his soul as prophetic, it is as though he answers the ghost with his own enunciation. And I suggest that in an interpretation of the pithy oracle is that Hamlet has an immediate, by that I mean in the phrase, oh my prophetic soul, that somehow that phrase is an immediate grasp of the whole of the tragedy in the moment of its utterance. I don't say that he consciously knows exactly each step in, as, as the play unfolds. I say that he immediately in that phrase and in, 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 in the face of this immortal soul and in conjunction with his own, grasps the entirety of the situation. It comes as something that Jacques Maritain would, might call a flash of reality or insight in which the entire form in a nutshell is then to be played out in the duration of this play, for instance, but is first intended, impressed, beheld in the mind's eye, the imagination as a creative intuition. Thus, the uncanny quality to Shakespeare's Hamlet lies in its temporal expression of suffering unto birth and form over the time of the play, the vision. Already glimpsed by Hamlet and the audience, so that his suffering is a sustained vision of loss where he moves and yet is static. The phrase, oh, the phrase, oh my soul, is a kind of Jeremiad found in many books of the prophets and the insertion here of the prophetic adjectiv adjectivally does not put forth Hamlet as a prophet per se, so prophetic rather than prophet, but as one who is inspired. Your own Dean Fitzgerald happens to be an expert on the evolution of the prophetic up until just shy of Hamlet's day if we figure his dates as somewhere between 1350 to 1500, since the years are never uh, made quite clear. But after the time of the prophets, who predicted Christ, whose coming then renders the need for such prophets obsolete, the prophetic was seen as an inspired way thereafter of looking back at the prophetic books to understand hidden things that in retrospect we may now understand better, or need for our present dictates. This is something of what I'm getting at when I say that the prophetic is rather a deep way of reading and interpreting what comes to us backwards, to use the word Jungian depth psychologist James Hillman does in his book called The Soul's Code when he says, reading life backward means that growth is less key, less the key biographical term than form. And that development only makes sense when it reveals a facet of the original image. The image of your fate holds all in the co-presence of today, yesterday, and tomorrow. While Hamlet tests all he learns from the ghost in the time of the play and to find what T.S. Eliot calls objective correlatives, though T.S. Eliot didn't think Hamlet succeeded in finding those um, objective correlatives, but I do, um, or evidence as the action, action unfolds, creating the play's duration. I want to say further that the action as tragic is indicated by the fully rounded shape of the lyrical and apostrophic O as the original form of his life, coming full circle in this play that is at the end of, uh, of his life, that is leading to his death. When Hamlet reads it backward, and that um, reads it backward in the sense of, at his per in his present moment, he realizes that he has been cursed since the day he was born to, to do this thing, so that somehow it's all coming forward, when prior to this, he would have thought his life was more progressive. I'm going to marry Ophelia, I'm going to become king, I'm going to do this, right? And everything is different because he sees it for what it is. It was always the way, it, <laughs> the, the way, the, the way that he's seeing it now, right? He was never going to marry Ophelia or be, ki be, be king. 
um, which isn't quite fatalistic, right? But, um, but we can talk about that later. Um, with the silver lining ultimately being that this too shall pass, that redemptive suffering is in the end shaped by divinity, and this is key to countering Claudius's timelessness and resetting time, temporal and temporary. So the O figures vocatively, calling into being a woeful form of tragedy wherein Shakespeare uses the apostrophe most. It is a prophetic signaling of the need for a prophetic self-reflection, not into why Claudius killed King Hamlet, but into how it was possible. If Hamlet wants time to move forward, if he wants Denmark out of stasis, he must suffer the backward glance into the sins of his own father. He must wrestle with himself, with the devil, with God, and with the past to unearth deeper, more hidden sins, and perhaps religious content even more profound than household ones. But Hamlet is always on the side of good, even when he trespasses, and he will succeed in saving his own soul and some truths for the future of Denmark and us. All tragedies have a current crisis that expose um, an underlying one. Claudius may be the most relative of evils, but he is really an opportunist. Privier to the Renaissance ideas that simply put, very simply put, may have, one say, may have a person say one thing while meaning another, where the medieval worldview once emphasized sacramentality and the outward sign being symbolic, therefore deeply connected to an inward reality. So, Claudius is a liar who destroys an innocent Denmark, but perhaps a Denmark that is too, uh, that is culpably innocent. For I hint that the ghost of King Hamlet coming in the armor almost as his bodily form to be visible, right, so that you can see him, um, and that he wore the day he defeated King Fortinbras of Norway and won lands that surround and protect Denmark signifies both his triumph and his sin. Dared to the combat, quote, dared to the combat in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who by a sealed compact did forfeit with his life all those his lands. This is the same day, 30 years earlier, that Hamlet was born. Under pressure, and in retrospect, cursed to reset time and die young. This is confirmed in Act 4 when Hamlet visits the graveyard and holds the skull as a memento mori or reminder of impending death. And even the gravedigger notes that he got his job on the day of that battle between King Fortinbras and King uh, Hamlet, that same day of Hamlet's birth. Only Adam gets credit for sinning originally, when time really went out of joint. But the door to the death of Denmark was open prior to Claudius's opportunistic taking advantage. And so for Denmark, things went awry with the Hamlets. Evil, of course, um, is relative, and Claudius becomes steeped in it, while the Hamlets are merely um, temporarily negligent, right? Or let's not, or let's say as, uh, let's say, not as ready as they should be. Literally, then, um, I, um, you might see that I really like Hamlet. Um, I have to admit, when I realized he was 30, it was a little bit of a blow, because why isn't he already married? Or why has, what's he doing off in Wittenberg? What's he doing, right? This life of leisure that he has. So there's something about, about the leisure that was gained from the, from the win, <laughs> right? The lands that surround and protect. Um, and this leisure is a wonderful thing. So you can study and you can do all of these things. But how has he been getting ready, right? Well, what was he getting ready for? Well, actually, I do think he is well, well prepared for his, for his, for his actual vocation, right? For his actual end. Um, but there is a sense here of, of, of somehow perhaps they were not as vigilant as they could have been. 
literally, Denmark is a hamlet, a sanctuary surrounded by layers of lands from outside attack, yet unaware of the harm that can arise from within a state, even from one's own brother, as Abel knew. This is indicated, I think, by the king being murdered, not while actively combating evil, but while resting, perhaps on his laurels, sleeping in the garden that had gone for too long unattended and unweeded, and becomes at the hands of Claudius the now dying garden of Denmark. In some ways, this and all tragedy acts as a vaccine of knowledge, such that we have more armor against man's capacity to poison. But if Prince Hamlet is to restore dignity and the rights of memory of a valiant King Hamlet to Denmark, he must be as pure of heart as he can muster. He must be more than a suffering hero and something of a suffering God. For this Christian prince, we cannot help but think of Christ as model. But in a breaking world, one fraught over religion, Shakespeare digs deeper to protect his head from Protestant Elizabeth, but also to reveal that the pattern of descent and scapegoat that purifies the world pre-existed Christ, who fulfilled it, perhaps too perfectly, to those who have no eyes to see or ears to hear. Yet, if Christ is forgotten, if what he accomplished is lost, as it is in danger of being in our own time, today, and so it must be at times in history and throughout the world, Shakespeare takes Hamlet and us to an earliest example of the catabasis, the one who goes down to atone and save, to the archetype of the suffering demigod, Hercules. Unlike Christ, Hercules is himself guilty to some extent of something, of some sin, having in a fit of madness, not fully brought on by himself, but nevertheless in a fit of madness, killed his family, showing us that there are many ways to prophesy to the blind and to the deaf. And one is to go pre-Christ, to prepare those who cannot see or hear for the fullness of Christ, as though Christ can come again for the first time. And so that those of us who remained chain, who remain chained in Plato's cave can see the light, but see it slant, coming by degrees to truth. Heracles, the name meaning the glory of Hera, um, this is the Greek, so the Hercules is the Roman, the, 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 the Greek name is Heracles, meaning the glory of Hera, quite ironically, because the god was born to Zeus and a mortal woman, not his wife. And therefore was given this, um, this name was given to the child to, in the hopes of appeasing Hera. It doesn't work, but... Um, uh, um, Hera's fury is... is, is eternal. Um, the footprint of Heracles is large, and his cult was so widespread. Known as Hercules to the Romans, he thereafter falls away from cultural significance, and the Christian mind, only enjoying a resurgence in the Renaissance, and appearing as in at least 36 direct mentions in the plays of Shakespeare, mostly, as critics dismiss, as a kind of shorthand for the ideal of hero, that his own heroes either meet or not. In Hamlet, though, Hercules becomes more in my reading, but is the image of temporal bearing and enduring that is key to understanding Hamlet and his type of devotion and suffering. Not only are there four mentions of Hercules in Hamlet, but one is significantly anachronistic and pertains above all to our topic at hand, and I'll get back to it, and uh, there are many more related in, uh, references where his name isn't mentioned, but there, it's clearly a Herculean reference. In fact, as an overarching um, orientation, 
And apart from Hercules' famous labors, Ophelia introduces the choice of Hercules, oft depicted in Renaissance art, into the text. A Greek fable finds the hero offered the difficult path of virtue, but with final reward, or the easy path of vice with nothing thereafter. Speaking to Laertes early in the play as he prepares to go back to school after the funeral of King Hamlet, Ophelia bears his insufferable advice and offers some of her own. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart, but, good my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads and wrecks not his own reed. The choice of Hamlet is the path of virtue over vice, or in Ophelia's words, the steep and thorny way to heaven over the primrose path of dalliance. Thus does the distinction between Hamlet and Claudius become starker and evince the highness of the stakes. That Hercules is emblematic for Shakespeare is evidenced by the image on his globe, theater. Of Hercules, carrying the terrestrial globe with the tagline, all the world's a stage. This is in reference to the labors of Hercules. We recall that Hera tried to kill the baby by sending snakes to his crib which the strongest hero strangled. She subsequently tried many times to thwart Hercules and eventually sent the madness into which he killed his family, though in most versions of the story, it's, um, she sends this madness because he has a proclivity to madness. <laughs> right? he, he has a, a, a flaw um, where he can lose his temper, and she uh, blows that out of proportion, and so, so, so he, he kills his family. When he awakes, Hercules wants to atone and is given 10 increasingly impossible labors. labors. But because he accepted two of them, um, because he got help with two of these labors, he's uh, at two more are added, such that there are 12. So we see that Hamlet is one who labors, who is given tasks or commands to fulfill. The first of the um, added on labors to Hercules is the 11th. And this is the one depicted on the Globe Theater with Hercules holding the world. And it's also the one that seems to appear anachronistically in Hamlet. That is, out of time. Hercules was asked to retrieve three apples of immortality from Hera's tree in the Garden of the Hesperides. After pinning the prophetic and shape-shifting sea god Proteus down, Hercules finds Atlas, the great titan of endurance, punished to hold the world for his part in the Titanomachy, the war of the older titans against the undefeated younger Olymp Olympian gods. So we all know, we know that image of Atlas holding the world, right? And what do you mean Hercules is holding the world? Well, it's Atlas, right, except that in this 11th labor, as he's going to get these apples, he comes to Atlas, and Atlas says to him, those nymphs in the garden are my daughters. I'll go get those apples for you. Would you mind relieving me of this world for just a bit? Um, and Hercules takes on the world. And in some stories, it's quite funny because things jostle, and that's how we get shooting stars and all sorts of things, because the Titan is stronger than Hercules, who is the strongest demigod, right? Um, in fact, sometimes uh, um, Athena is said to have helped with the transferals. Um, Atlas gets these apples and comes back and says, hey, you seem okay. Why don't I just go and deliver these apples to the king who has conscripted you to all these labors, and then I'll be back. And Hercules says, oh, okay, but would you just mind taking the world back for a second while I adjust my lion skin? <laughs> this is heavy, right? And the lion skin, we know he got from the first of those 12 labors. He killed the Nemean lion whose skin was impenetrable so he could not shoot him with an arrow or he had to strangle him or beat him depending on which uh, story right with his club or and he then um, uses the the, the the Nemean lion's own claws to 
tear off that skin and then he uses it for a protection as an armor so to speak going forward but also a cushion I guess right so he says could you just take this back and the minute Atlas takes that world back Hercules picks up those three apples and flees so he's held it temporarily right um, it is no easy task to hold the world, right? Um, but I want to say that Hamlet is a Hercules. Despite some denial, for the first reference is uh, to Hercules comes when Hamlet talks about Claudius and says, um, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Yet he grows into the comparison, and the important reference comes in Act Two, when the players come to Elsinore. Hamlet is told about the state of the theater at that time and how the younger generation is taking over. So a little bit of a tightonomachy uh, thing there, right? Um, and even Hercules and his load are affected, as Rosencrantz says, which appears to be uh, an anachronistic reference to the Globe Theater, which would not have been um, in existence in Hamlet's time, right? Um, this, I hope to show, significantly touches on the temporality of Hamlet's burden as he bears the world for a time, having relieved his own Titan father. Not Atlas, but Hyperion. Hamlet also compares his father to Hamlet compares himself to Claudius, but then he also compares, uh, on a couple of occasions, Claudius to um, to his father, right? And his his father is the better of the two. Uh, Claudius he calls a satyr, right? A goat man, right? He says, so excellent a king that was to this, Hyperion to a satyr, right? Later on he says something about Hy um his father looked like a god with his Hyperion curls. This classical reference gets to the core of the weights Hamlet bears. Hyperion was the Titan father of heavenly light, an early sun divinity and father of Helios, and Hamlet is too much in the sun for a melancholic soul, yet both Hamlets are ahead of their time a bit and heliocentric unlike the geocentric worldly Claudius. Hyperion was also the pillar titan. Prior to Atlas holding the world as a punishment, the world was thought to have four corners, right? And there were four titans holding each corner. And Hyperion was the easternmost pillar holding up his portion of the world um, and ultimately participating in the castration of Uranus, right, or, um, that, that, that Gaia insists on. Um, uh, so how, how do I have it here? I say, and perhaps even so that Uranus could be ca castrated and ultimately after the interim of Cronus, a time of order under Zeus be achieved. So that Hyperion helps usher in the Olympian gods in some way. Hercules is a pre-Christ type, a, a hero prophetic of Christ, a first layer of the palimpsest that Christ rewrites but doesn't erase, a figure of temporal suffering holding the globe was not like the punishment of the Titan Atlas eternal. For Shakespeare then, as he depicts in his greatest hero Hamlet, we are servants in the image of Christ, bearing for a time a world that goes around well if we do our parts. Even Hamlet's holding of the skull of Yorick up for meditation might be seen as bearing the distracted globe of his own weighty mind and the deaths of so many before him. So even just the holding of that globe is, is sort of depicted there, right? He'd already called his, his head a globe of his own weighty mind and the deaths of so many before him listed in the ubi sunt poetry of Hamlet. Where have they all gone? Hercules, Jesus, Yorick, his father, Ophelia. Who's there? The opening line of the play asks. The heroes of bygone times are present in memory 
and recovered as though on an atlas, but not easily, so the wrong ones can't find them, to allude to Robert Frost's directive. There were giants on the earth in those days, Mary Mumbuck, right? But the giants of the Gigantomachy were not so great. They launch a second war on Zeus, and there is a prophecy that says only if a hero were to take the side of the gods would the gods succeed. Hercules' greatest attachment was to men, to the human being. He could have gone to heaven, to the heavens as a god any time, but willingly chose to stay on earth and then even to suffer his labors. Yet the world of man would be destroyed by these literal not-so-bright giants who pile up mountains to try and reach Olympus. And so does or Hercules fulfill the prophetic by defending the gods. This is Hamlet's lot, one that I say is a Virgilian lot, a bibliomancy, a fate found in the book, in a book of Aeneid. Act two of Hamlet is an intertext with book two of Aeneid. But just before I get there, I want to speak about a word in Act 5 that pertains to the giants and to the Virgilian lot as I see it. The fool, Osric, who acts as messenger of Claudius to come to Hamlet's room where he is talking with Horatio, triggering the providence in a fall of a sparrow speech, to tell him that the king has put a wager on him to win against Laertes in a duel. Right? Remember that Hamlet has somewhat accidentally killed Laertes' father. It's an unfortunate incident. Um, <coughs> and Laertes wants justice, and Claudius has seduced Laertes into um, plant, plotting to kill. Um, to kill. But, but what's coming here is that the messenger is saying, listen, the king has bet that you will win this duel. But Laertes has also put, placed a bet. Um, he's added on to the bet to say that he will win. He has placed, uh, the king placed six Barbary horses, and Laertes himself has piled on and put up six swore, swords, suggesting that he will win. The king, sir, says Osric, hath wagered with him six Barbary horses, against which he has imponed, as I take it, six French rapiers and poniards. There is a wonderful article that says the made-up word imponed um, would interest Hamlet, who, like Shakespeare himself, has a love for words and their forms and coinage, and that it somehow signals Hamlet, communicates to him that the end is near, which is why it seems as though he gives up so easily and just goes to this providence in the fall of a sparrow speech and walks into his death, right? Which critics are upset about. But somehow this word imponed has sent a message to him. Suggesting that the word is Virgilian, the article lands on the most likely source as a description in Aeneid of the pile up of Mounts Osa and Pelion by the giants, both also mentioned by Hamlet and Laertes. As they wrestle in the grave and try to outdo each other in terms of who loved Ophelia more, right? As though they're piling up um, things. I think the pile up lets Hamlet know that something is awry by Laertes' piling swords on top of the Barbary horses, as though they're protesting too much, right? That something, something's up. <coughs> but he accepts the challenge anyway letting be. But the, word is a form, but the word is a form of imponere, which is the Latin meaning to pile or put on, to impose, to put. If we look for a moment at Act 2 of the play, in the context of the second use of a prophetic form, <coughs> in which Hamlet says about Polonius, who Professor Esselin tried to get everybody in there, um, calls a rhetorical traitor in platitudes and who is coming after the fact of Hamlet's already knowing to say that the players have arrived. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players. 
This hindsight prophecy is somewhat mocking of the worldly prognosticators and the ways the prophetic can be played and manipulated. It's also playing with forms, which we see him do with the play within the play. And to quote Polonius, these are the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral. Hamlet may see, know, and accept he is in a tragedy. But he does test the other genres just in case. <coughs> Indeed, as we have said, Hamlet is more like the epic Aeneas than the tragic Oedipus. However, Hamlet engages in real hindsight prophecy, either a memory of a Sortes Virgilianae or just a text that from his youth he now understands better interpreting prophetically in this moment. Hamlet asks the players to perform a tragic speech from the epic Aeneid, perhaps via a play by Marlowe, um, but certainly calling us to book two of Virgil's work that was once not only used as a book to dispense fates through these sorts, right, but was also a primer of education. Everybody knew the Aeneid, and ha Hamlet certainly would have known it thoroughly. The speech is about the cruel death of King Priam, evoking a pathos of prophetic suffering. The Trojan father of Paris and Hector, and even the prophetess Cassandra, cursed by Apollo to speak the truth but not be believed. The speech is about dead fathers and the sons who bear their burdens. Hamlet takes us to book two of Aeneid, not only for Priam, but for another suffering hero, hero archetype, Aeneas, who takes on the task of carrying his own father as burden, quite literally, on his shoulders. Dear father, let them set you on my shoulder. I'll carry you. You will not weigh me down. Whatever happens, it will be one peril or rescue for us both. And now I pulled a tawny lion skin over my bending neck and brawny shoulder and took my load. The shared burden of Aeneas and Hamlet as sons comes even through the figure of Hercules as both carry with them the household gods but also major religions. Moreover, the Latin text of the passage has as the word that is translated above by Sarah Rudin let them set you on imponere. So the, the word imponere is in the Latin for this scene of him putting, them, putting the father on his shoulders and I guess I'm suggesting to you that the word imponed <laughs> in Act 5 is reminding him of his own fate, of his own, if, of, his, uh, of who he is, of his destiny and the fulfillment. So that when Hamlet hears the word imponed in Act 5, he knows he has moved from infinitive forms to put on, imponere, or to be, to the past tense of being finished and letting be. While there is still so much more to be said, I will end with the final usage of a form of the prophetic in Hamlet's final words that point to the middle stage of suffering being born into the last one of reconciliation. Although we only have a blind hope that Fortinbras will be an adequate political ruler, it seems clear that this framing story is the intuited time frame for Hamlet to achieve the right moment, or chiron, of tragedy, and thereby in a sense reset time. Because Hamlet is willing to go, let go of Denmark, sort of um, the Solomon, right, that, that, that I'd rather that the baby live, right? I'd rather Denmark live. He's willing to, to, to die for it. To submit to the temporal, he is allowed just enough time to dismantle and clean it. So if my contention is that Claudius is, has a Machiavellian will to power in which he overrules and erases time's distinctions and 
Hamlet resets time by willing to being willing to submit to it, right? And give up his 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 throne, so to speak. He is allowed just enough time to dismantle and clean it. I think of those situations, not everyone is able to do it, but there are enough stories that say people who are dying can hold on until the last child comes home to say goodbye or the last, right? That somehow you can stretch something out. This isn't a will to power. This is a negotiation and a cooperation with God to have enough time to, to, to make a good end. So let me say it again. Because Hamlet is willing to let go of Denmark, to submit to the temporal, he is allowed just enough time to dismantle and clean it, as well as to prepare its future king to properly receive it. We know Fortinbras. <coughs> Bear with me for a second here. We know that Fortinbras has, um, by his very name, strong arms. So I want to suggest that he is he becomes something of an atlas here as Hamlet hands the world over to Fortinbras. Has the strong arms, as his name suggests, to hold the kingdom to which he has some perhaps prior <laughs> um, rights of memory, to holding the world as does Atlas. But Hamlet's delays that critic makes critics make so much of can now be seen as a waiting for Fortinbras's return, as a kind of procrastination that makes enough tomorrows not to overrule time, but to transfer a world and make a good ending. Even more, Hamlet has directed his energies towards staging the final scene in such a way as to disarm Fortinbras, that is to allow him to lay down his arms and rather embrace in sorrow his fortune. If, if Fortinbras had to come in fighting, he doesn't have time to listen to anything, but because it's given to him, handed over to him as a gift, I don't know how nice a gift this is, but as a gift, right, he can hear, he can see. He has eyes to see and ears to hear. We hear him order four captains to bear Hamlet away in honor, and we hear him say to Horatio, what has happened here? Tell me, I wanna hear, I wanna hear the story. So Hamlet predicted Fortinbras. He saw him in the O of his prophetic soul as that which would come back around, making right whatever went wrong generationally on the day of our hero's birth. In his last words, Hamlet says, I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. The rest is silence. By giving tragic assent, to the what is of necessity, the cursed spite of battle becomes the gift of a joint and lightened load for both Hamlet and Fortinbras. Even gods need relief, right? To share, we can participate in what Christ did for us, right? We can share um, the burden and bear and bear others' troubles and sins, etc. Though even here the verb lights means falls on, indicating the political weight Fortinbras will now bear. These words show us the shaping and speaking agency of the prophetic redress of poetry that Shakespeare maps for us. By predicting Fortinbras, Hamlet provides through his dying voice and then again through his story as to be retold by Horatio, not only an afterword about a medieval way of life, but also a foreword or prologue for a new myth that got started off on the wrong foot by Claudius, but has been properly restated, leaving the hamlets properly mourned and buried and resting in peace. And in the 1623 folio edition, Hamlet's last words, the rest is silence, have right after them in this edition Hamlet saying oh 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 the end <laughs>